morning and welcome to our worship service on this Resurrection Sunday morning. Good to have you with us. Good to see uh, a number of visitors with us as well this morning. We hope that uh, as we work through our service today, you will enjoy our time of worship. Uh, just a couple of very quick things. First of all, uh, our hearts go out to a couple of families of very important parts of our church family, uh, both to uh, Nova Zenderman's family and to uh, Jack Green's family. You'll see in the bulletins the information regarding um, the services for them that will be held this coming week. I want to thank uh, Marlon and Ellie for being here today. Thank you so much. Uh, you always add so much to our Easter. I mean, it's always good to have you with us. Um, everything else can wait till next week, all right? Are there any other announcements that you have that can't wait? If not, let's stand and let's sing this morning together about our triumphant Lord.
Lord Jesus Christ. Please join me in our call to worship, taken from Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become our salvation. Christ is risen. Life triumphs over 
the light of Christ rises in glory, overcoming the darkness of sin and death. Let us confess our faith in His great victory over sin and the grave. O our God, through our Lenten journey, we have been reminded of the events of the last days of the life of Jesus. We have seen His courage, we have heard His challenges, we have witnessed His faithfulness, we have observed His suffering, we have mourned His death. Today we bear witness to the first day of forever. We embrace the wonder of your triumph over sin and death. To you belongs all glory and honor and power forever and ever. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our soon coming King. Do not dwell on your wounds any longer, for Jesus, Jesus has risen to heal us, he has risen to forgive us, he has risen to change us, he has risen to give us abundant life. We are people of his love, we are people of life. In our risen Savior, we have life overflowing with God's peace and joy. Make room for this peace in your hearts and share this joy with one another. Please stand and greet one another with the joy of Christ. Good morning. Good morning.
Our first reading comes to us from the 25th chapter of Isaiah, to a people who are starving for God's presence. The prophet preaches, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up of this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Our second reading comes to us from the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. After Peter learned the breadth of the gospel in a vision from God and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, he said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
concentrating on just the Gospel of Mark. So this morning, hear the good news of the Gospel from Mark, and listen to what it says. Not everything else that we remember from every other Easter, but just listen to these eight verses. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
on Friday. It ended with his shameful death by crucifixion, the kind of death doled out to criminals. But far from a criminal, Jesus was the victim of unjust actions of a selfish religious authorities that existed in Jerusalem and the powerful political forces of the Roman Empire. The day that followed on Saturday was a grim reminder that his celebrated life and all of the hopes and dreams that he brought were over. His lifeless body, along with our hopes and dreams, lay in the tomb, a tomb provided by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling elite, watched over by someone named Joseph from Arimathea. He was one of their members. Such a tomb was a place where the bodies of those who were criminals were placed. You see, criminals could not be placed in tombs of honor. They couldn't be buried along with their families. In most cases, criminals were buried in shallow ditches or crudely carved out spaces in the clefts of rocks, if they were even buried at all. But according to Jewish law, the Sanhedrin, when ordering someone to die, also was responsible then to provide a place for the bodies of those who died so that they could decompose and that the land would not be defiled. After the bodies decayed, the bones could be gathered a year later, and then they could be transferred to some family ossuary and buried and kept in a place of honor. It was customary back then to visit a tomb and mourn outside of its walls on the third day following a death. That was the custom. You see, it was the crucial day before the decaying body became unrecognizable. On some occasions, the mourners would actually go inside of the tombs to grieve more intimately. It was such an occasion that we witnessed in the passage that Bruce read for us this morning. If the mourners were going inside, powerful spices were necessary in order to cover death's decaying scent that was in the air so that those who went in could actually do their mourning. It was traditionally on the third day when mourning for the lost reached its peak, its highest point, the day when all official hope was lost. But on the third day in our text, we will discover that hope is not lost, it's actually found. Ah, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The women who followed the events of Friday and witnessed the place where Joseph laid the body of Jesus arrived at the dawning of the third day. It was the first time they were permitted to travel. It was the first moments of the official start of the day after the Sabbath day. It was the first moments that followed the official end of the last week of the life of Jesus. It was the first moments of forever. Prepared to grieve, they instead encountered a mystery. <clears throat> you see, the primary topic of discussion on the way to the tomb was how they would successfully get through the obstacle of the tomb security. The security existed in a large boulder that they noticed had been used to cover the entrance. Their grief for Jesus was such that only by being within the tomb, close to the body, could they adequately express their love and their loss. So with their spices in tow, they discovered that the problem that they were anticipating was solved already. The large stone was rolled away. In Mark's story, they didn't encounter a dead body. They didn't encounter the smell that they thought they would have when they got there. 
They didn't experience an angel. They didn't observe any soldiers. In Mark's story, instead, they encounter a young man who is sitting on the right side of the tomb, and he's dressed in a white robe. If we paid attention to Mark's story in the last week of the life of Jesus, the young man tells us everything we need to know about our wonderful gospel. You see, a young man was part of Mark's story on the night that Jesus was arrested. A young man was seen last streaking, leaving his robe behind in the clutches of those who were trying to apprehend him as one of the followers of Jesus. He was running naked out of fear, his nakedness a picture of shame. In Mark's story, he is Adam and Eve all over again, naked and ashamed, yet hiding in the fear within the garden. He's fleeing like they did from the presence of God who created them for loving relationship. Now Mark says there's a young man in the tomb and he's dressed. He's dressed in a white robe, the official garment of the overcoming saints who have received their reward of eternal life amid heavenly celebration. Sin and its posse of fear and shame have been defeated. Death has been conquered. Adam and Eve's failure has been remedied. That's what Mark's story is all about. The young man has overcome by the blood of the Lamb, and he announces that Jesus has been given new life, and he awaits to see his disciples, especially Peter, in Galilee. You and I might be surprised at the response of the women in Mark's story. You see, it's not a response of joy. It is not, yes, we knew it all the time, or it's not some sense of confidence. Yes, it finally happened. They were instead seized with trembling and astonishment, strong words representing almost being paralyzed by fear. And Mark tells us that they fled the scene out of fear. And then curiously, Mark ends his story. Mark has finished telling us the gospel in his understanding, in his terms. He's finished telling us what he believed we needed to know to understand the gospel and believe it. <clears throat> the rest of what follows after this text in most of your Bibles was added at a later date in an effort to help us fill in the blanks. What might we add into the story this morning to help us make its meaning more powerful and effusive in our lives? What can we glean from this and other scriptural writings that try to explain the wonder of such an event? To try to put something into words that is beyond words. Try to explain the wonder of resurrection. I ask you to imagine something with me this morning. If news had traveled to you that I had passed away, some of you might grieve my passing. I'm also aware that some of you may celebrate it. I know Julie would grieve it. Where are you, Julie? You would, wouldn't you? Yeah, you would. Some of you would. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you see, death is final. It's unfixable. It's unchangeable. It appears when it wants, how it wants, and the way it wants. And suppose in our imaginative world you gather for my funeral some days later. You view my body. You pay your respects to Julie and my children and my grandchildren. And suppose I paid off one of my minister friends to come and say some good things about me. Maybe Gavin or Ed or Steve, and they figure out something to say about me that would be nice. It costs a lot of money, but. <laughs> Suppose they say to you, Thomas died, 
but we know that he lives on in our memories. Or maybe they say to you, Tom's spirit is here among us. Or maybe they say, we know Tom is probably looking down and watching us right now. Fretting over the details of the service and obsessing over whether everybody's happy or not. Maybe they say, we have a sense of his presence with us. And we know that what Tom believed and taught and tried to live, it's still a work. Most of you would probably nod in some form of agreement. Some of you might say, dear God, I hope not. But most of you would probably agree with much of what they would say in their hopes that somehow some memory of me would live on. But I gotta tell you, if I were to sit up in the casket and say, I'll meet you at Pepper Mills and for the buffet at 12 noon today so we can have a discussion, you all might be a little startled. You might run out of the place. You might even go tell the community through the information pipeline that exists in Napoleon where everybody knows everything about everyone and it probably would all be known within an hour. Just like all the other Napoleon news. You might even say, that was different. But I dare say you'd be curious. That's the wonder of the resurrection. It's wonder focus forces us to ask the question, what would that mean if I were to sit up and I were to say, Pepper Mills, noon, be there. What does it mean that the Tom who died, the Tom that Julie mourned, the Tom you gathered to pay your final respects to, is now back among you in his body, in his mind, and in full human form, wanting to eat at Peppermills. I dare say that the first thought that you might have or conclusion that you would draw is not, great, we all get to go to heaven. It might ultimately get to that conclusion if we consider all of its implications. But the obvious conclusion would be focused that something magnificent and mysterious has happened to life as we know it. Something far more vast and profound has happened right in front of us. You would have to deduce that life as you knew it, life as you understood it, life as you come to expect it, has fundamentally changed, radically changed, limitlessly changed. So what does the resurrection of Jesus mean? What do we mean when we move from the last week of the life of Jesus to into the first of forever? First of all, it means that what Jesus did in the way of miracles that brought healing to our world, what Jesus said about how life is to be lived, what Jesus represented in the way of a countercultural movement opposed to the power structures of our world, that all of those things have been validated. His teachings to us to turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, forgive those who deeply hurt us, love those who are our enemies, valuing humility and servanthood and meekness and contentment. No matter how illogical they seem, no matter how much they don't appear to fit into our world, it would mean if Jesus were actually resurrected that God was validating those things. That they had received God's approval and blessing. Resurrection is God's enthusiastic approval and endorsement of Jesus. It also means that Jesus was the first bit of creation that was set right or restored to glory as part of God's healing of the world. After the corruption of evil and death had done its very worst to him, Jesus became the firstborn from the dead, the foundation stone of a new creation upon which all of heaven and all of earth will be made new. What was done through God's power in raising Jesus from the dead is promised to us and to creation. It is the certainty 
that God has begun to heal the damage done in the Garden of Eden. What happened to Jesus will happen to us. What happened to Jesus will happen to the entire scope of heaven and earth. Everything will be made right. Resurrection is God's powerful opening act to the complete restoration of all things. Lastly, it means that Jesus, as the first to be raised from the dead, has now been invested with the right to judge the world with the God-approved, God-validated, God-vindicated righteousness. He has been elevated to the right hand of the majesty on high to sit, not as a condemning, condescending, vindictive judge, which we always picture, but as the one who has tasted death for every person and has conquered that death with new life. Everything that is true and lovely and of good report will be vindicated, enhanced, and set free from pain and sorrow. And everything that is wicked will be made right. The healing that Jesus brought with him in his birth will be the healing that will abound when he comes again. Wickedness will be addressed, goodness will be affirmed, and righteousness will be rewarded. If we were to return to the scene of my casket or the ensuing meal at Pepper Mills, I think that each of you could imagine what would, that, it, what, that what had happened to me could be possible for others. It wouldn't be only limited to me. In other words, if something so spectacular, some, something so imaginable could happen to me, then there is the possibility that it could happen to others. And if it happens to others, then life within the strict parameters as we know it is somehow changed. Imagine what it would look like if what happened to me happened to the entire world. Imagine what it would look like if the sin and death that took my life was eradicated so completely that new life complete with body, soul, and spirit could be experienced on this earth that has itself received new life. Resurrection invites us to imagine a world that's been made right after the pattern of Jesus. It's the solid bedrock truth of the Christian faith. God is not going to abolish our universe. He's not going to burn it up out of his intense rage and displeasure. Our scriptures do not end with a picture of the world's dis destruction, but rather a glorious image of a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to this earth, resolving in God's new creation. New heavens, new earth, new bodies to live and work and take delight in all of this newness. The first of forever is the good news that this new world has already begun. It began when Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead in triumphant victory over sin and death that corrupted God's people and defaced God's good creation. We are commanded to advance this new world's coming by loving one another. We've been commissioned as ambassadors of this new creation to bring pieces of it into our world, the world in which we live. The pieces are carried through the power of forgiveness. It is a forgiveness that starts with an individual's getting right with God, but it continues with individuals getting right with each other. It is a forgiveness that can only be described as a new way of life, a restoring force that heals families and communities and nations and even our world. When you and I see the resurrection, we see the beginning of God's judgment. Sin and death have been judged, and life has replaced them. Life has conquered death, and the seeds of this truth have been planted into us by faith. We are to be busy sowing these seeds in our world around us. We're to look forward to the day when the subsequent fruit these seeds produce are united, come joined together with the power that's revealed when our resurrected King comes to rule and to reign. To that I say,
Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for the wonder, the mirror of resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.
one of those on your part that you would lift that up. Perhaps you have needs yourself, people that you are aware of that are struggling, people that uh, are in your own life that you want to commit to God. So we will pause in the midst of our prayer at that time. Please feel free to just silently lift those requests up to the Lord. This is our time of prayers of the people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come to you in full assurance of your love and your grace. We thank you, Father, that through the resurrection of Christ, we have been raised and seated with him in heavenly places. That, Father, we can come before you, a throne of grace, and receive help in our times of need. So this day we lift before you those who are needy and those who are struggling. We offer our prayers to you on behalf of these listed and the prayers of those who we know, and the prayers of those things that bind us and worry us. We offer them now in Jesus' name. <laughs> Touch everyone who is on our minds and our hearts, everyone who is on our list. We thank you, Father, for the celebrations this week. The celebration of Heather's birthday, of Matthew's birthday, of Alex and Emily's birthday today. Lord, we thank you for them. Thank you for life. Thank you for the joy of being able to do that life together. Lord, we offer these things to you through the mighty and precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, Power and glory forever. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May we be a people who celebrate the new life that is ours. And may we be bits and pieces of that new life to the world around us. Go in peace, for we are the body of Christ. Amen.